The events of September 11, 2001 forever changed our world. Among the many thousands of issues it has raised, two questions have risen to the top. What is Islam? And what do Muslims believe? The Straight Way of Grace ministry was founded to answer these tough questions, as well as to prepare the hearts of Christians to share the gospel lovingly and with compassion to their Muslim neighbors. The Straight Way of Grace ministry was established by Usama K. Dakdak, an Egyptian-born Christian who is fluent in both English and Arabic, and who holds a bachelor's degree in theology and a master's degree in missiology. Over the past several years, Usama has taken his series, Revealing the Truth About Islam, to television stations, radio stations, pulpits and classrooms all across America, equipping the church with both information and compassion in order to reach Muslims for Christ is the goal of the Straight Wave Grace Ministry. Muslim scholars claim that since its compilation over 1400 years ago, the Quran is a perfect book, unequaled in its revelation, its accuracy, and its poetry. They claim that it is the final and complete Word of God. But is that true? What if errors are to be found within its pages? Can a book that contains significant amount of mistakes be considered the infallible Word of God? In this eye-opening presentation, we will examine the many dozens of scientific, historical, biblical, theological, moral, social, and even legal errors within the Quran. Let's join you Sama now as we consider, is the Quran infallible? Allah was Is the Quran infallible? We're going to start first by the uh, geographical error in the Quran. I'm going to read a little bit story here. It's a long story, it's strange. We're going to put a little bit, few words uh, to help us to understand what Muhammad is talking about. And we come to understanding this. Is this really the word of God geographically correct? Listen to this verse first. They will ask you about Zu al Karnain. Say, I will recite to you an account of him. We establish him on the earth, and we gave him from everything away. So he followed away. Here Muhammad is talking in the Quran about the Zulkarnain, which Alexander the Great. All scholars say that Zulkarnain is Alexander the Great. Do you know that Muslims believe, according to their scholar interpretation to this specific verse, we read that Alexander the Great was another good prophet? He is a wicked man who is a, 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 an ancient who claimed to be a god himself who died in his young age. Muslim believe, according to the Quran, he was another good prophet. And this is the story of Alexander the Great from the Quran. Until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a muddy spring, and he found a people by it. We said, O Zul Karnain, either that you torment or that you take in them good. Of course, everybody know about Alexander the Great. He was uh, a man who had the army and he uh, take over, invade the whole world. And in the Quran here, Muhammad uh, emphasized on his moving all the way until he went where the sun settled. When it get dark in the evening, where the sun go? Muhammad gave us the answer. The sun set in a mudding spring. And some uh, Muslim scholar today say, wait a minute, wait a minute. He did not say he saw the sun set in the muddy spring, but he's thinking that that's how it looked like. It's like when you go to the beach and the sun looked like going under the water, but it's not going under the water. It looked like. No. When you read the Hadith, they ask Muhammad, what do you mean by muddy spring? He said, like water and mud. He literally believed that's where the sun set in a mudding spring. That's a big geographical error in the Quran. The sun does not set in any muddy spring. The sun is one million plus uh, a thousand of times bigger than the earth. It will not set in any water on planet earth. It's so just one error in the Quran. He said, as for those who are unjust, so we will torment. Then he will be returned to his Lord, so he will torment him with a horrible torment. And as to him who believed and did a good deed, so he will have the reward of the good, and we will say to him from our easy command. When you read this verse, he did not come up with the message of Alexander the Great. 
to whom he has been sent what was the word of God has revealed to him but here it is tormenting some people and giving uh, peace and, and grace to some other people those who believe he uh, allows them to live peacefully and those who do not believe he torments them and this is the message of Alexander the Great so many stories in the Quran you read about the prophet you never know who is the prophet where he came from where he went to what is his message was what he talked about who are the people who believe in him or not believe in him what happened to the people of the world story after story and here is one of them Alexander the Great then he followed away until when he reached the rising of the Sun he found that it rose on a people to whom we had given no shelter from it likewise and indeed we were aware of what he had then he followed a way until he came between the two mountains under which he found a people who could not understand words very strange words very strange sentence just another poetry system Muhammad is using he left all the way from the west to the east and he went all the way where he saw the Sun rising up and when the when he went there and saw the Sun rising up he saw it uh, rising among people who have no shelter and people do not understand words what words he's talking about I have no clue people do not understand words and then listen to the next verse they said Ozu al Karnain, surely Gog and Magog are vandalizing in the land. Shall we make to you a tribute that you make between us and them a barrier? He said, That in which my Lord has established me is better. So assist me with strength, and I will make a barrier between you and them. Even though in verse 93 he said, These people do not understand words, here they're speaking to Alexander the Great. And they're making sense as they're talking to him. And they told him about the problem about Gog and Magog and how these people are, 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 are a little bit fearful for them and they want to put a barrier between them and Gog and Magog. They want to build a fence, they want to build a big wall to protect them, maybe like China wall. And Alexander is a great uh, acceptor of it, but he said, I don't need your riches because they tell him, we, we will pay you taxes if you just help us to support us and protect us from this bad people. Help us to build a wall. Bring me blocks of iron until it equalizes between the two sides. He said, blow, until when he made it a fire, he said, bring me brass that I may pour over it. And they were not able to scale it, neither were they able to dig through it. What a great fence Alexander the Great built. It's made out of iron, melted iron, with brass cover it. Huge mountain he put between them, huge barrier between them and the Gog and Magog people. Well, we look around the world today and we can search every spot on planet Earth. There is no existence of such a mountain. What happened to this mountain? That's another error in the Quran. There is no such a thing as a mountain uh, Alexander the, the Great built or make it a barrier between these people who we don't know who they are, who live in this east side, which we don't know which part of the world, and it's just a story Muhammad made it up. Don't you think if there was a great mountain with this description covered with brass, made out of iron, covered with brass, there would be something left over after 2,000 years or so? The mountain disappeared. One of ge the geographical mistakes in the Quran is the number of earth and the number of heavens. Listen to chapter 65 verse 12. Allah is who has created seven heavens and the same number of earths. The divine command comes down through them all so that you may know that Allah has might over all things and that Allah indeed surrounds all things in knowledge. Seven heavens and seven earths I have a friend of mine who worked for NASA in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, and I told him about this, and he told me Muhammad is a liar. And I told him, seriously, I said, brother, you're wasting millions and billions of dollars. I don't know how much you're spending out in space to try to find out life on Mars or on some other planets. Why can't you search for the other six Earths? He said, six other Earths? I said, yes, Muhammad said in the Quran, seven Earths. He said, Muhammad is a liar. There's only one Earth. And when you read the Bible, my dear brothers and sisters, you found out clearly the Bible said three heavens. 
the heaven of the atmosphere. That's where the airplane fly and the bird fly. The second heaven is the heaven of the star, the sun and the moon and the star, which God has created by his hand. And the third heaven is the heaven of heaven. That's where Christ is after he has ascended to the third heaven. That's where John ascended to the third heaven and Paul also. And he himself, Paul, did not know if he has ascended to the third heaven in his flesh or just by his spirit. Three heavens, the Bible said, and the Quran said, seven heavens. Where is the other four? One earth, the Bible says, and the Quran said, seven earths. Where are the other six? I think this is another error in the Quran. What about the nature of this heaven? What does heaven look like? What it made of? Let's read the verses of the Quran and, and imagine with me, what, do, what does Muhammad thought of heaven to be? Do you not see that Allah has made what is on the earth subservient to you, and the ships run in the sea with his command? And he holds the heaven so that it will not fall on the earth except with his permission. Surely Allah is with the people, compassionate, merciful. In so many verses in the Quran, Muhammad clearly says that God is holding the heaven from falling on earth. Imagine with me, heaven is like the ceiling of this church. And God is holding the ceiling from falling off and crush the people on earth. Muhammad did not know that heaven is just air. It's empty atmosphere. He literally thought that heaven is like a roof of a house or a ceiling in a building. He created the heavens without columns. You see it. And he threw stabilizers on the earth, lest it should move with you. And he scattered livestock of every kind on it. And he sent down water from the heaven, so we grow plants in it from every generous pear. You see how great is Allah in the Quran, who created the heavens and he lifted up without pillars. When you look at a big sanctuary like this, and there is no any pillar in the middle, that requires lots of architect work here. There's some engineering build this huge building with no pillars in the middle. And you see all the ceiling above us lifted up without pillar. So is how great is God in the Quran. The God of Muhammad, he lifted up the heaven, this huge structure. He's holding by his hand, and he lifted up above the earth without any pillar. Did really Muhammad understood that heaven is empty atmosphere? No. I believe he believed that it is structure could fall off and people and kill them. And the earth, we spread it out and tossed on its stabilizers, and we planted in it from every weighted thing. As you read through the Quran, when Muhammad talk about the earth, always, always it is flat. As a matter of fact, in uh, Rashid, uh, Rashid, uh, Rashid uh, translation to the Quran, in his first page, he was making fun of Saudi Wahhabi about believing that the earth is flat. Wahhabi, the biggest Muslim jihadist in the world, are the one who sent money to build mosques all over in America. They literally believe that the earth is flat and they made fun of those who claim that the earth is round. And they kill Rashad in his mosque or some mosque in New Jersey, 37 snapped with knife because he made fun of their belief that the earth is not flat. And he tried hard in his translation to his the English Quran to make some verses said that the earth is like an egg or the earth is around and you could not find it anywhere in the Quran. The Quran clearly teaches that God spread out the earth, it is flat like a carpet, as some English translator, Muslim, put it. Is really the earth flat? We well, see, that's what most people believe in Muhammad days. That's what they believe until uh, Christopher Columbus and his discovery that the earth is not flat. What does the Bible teach about the earth? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. How did Isaiah know 700 years before Christ, that's a good 1300 years before Muhammad, that the earth is circle? Ah, oh, maybe Isaiah was a true prophet. Maybe Isaiah was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he wrote and he said in his book that the earth is circle 2700 years ago. And obviously Muhammad make an error because he claims that the earth is what? 
flat swearing in the Quran it's amazing that uh, God in the Quran we're gonna see this a little bit later when we talk about uh, other error in the Quran God swear in the Quran with everything almost and uh, here is the one important verse which Muslim scholar claim that you need the Hadith to understand the Quran what Muhammad said uh, in the Hadith is really an explanation to what is written in the Quran so many Muslims say you cannot understand the Quran unless you read it in Arabic and you cannot understand the Quran unless you read uh, the Hadith Muhammad's statement about many verses in the Quran and you cannot understand the Quran unless you read the interpretation of Muslim scholar here is one very important verse listen to it Q I swear by the glorious Quran in chapter 50 verse 1 which by the way is the name of the chapter the book of Kaf or chapter Kaf which is actually uh, one letter in Arabic mean nothing and uh, here is God is swearing by the Kaf and God is swearing by the glorious Quran so what is Kaf? As, as Muslim scholars will tell you, that you need to understand the Hadith to understand the Quran. We go to the Hadith and we search, we see what Muhammad claim, what is Kaf is. And you read in the Hadith that there were some Jew went to Muhammad, uh, tried to ask him a question to catch him with saying mistakes. If you remember in the Bible, in the New Testament, many times the Jew will go to Jesus and they try to ask him a question to test him to catch him make an error uh, like one time they went to Jesus and they gave him a coin and they, uh, sorry they asked Jesus uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not and Jesus said give me a coin and he answered to whom this head on the coin Who, whose money is this Caesar he said give to Caesar what is to Caesar and give to God what is to God and some other time the Jewish people brought this woman who committed adultery and threw it before Jesus said Moses says this woman have committed adultery we must stone her what would you do Jesus and Jesus gently said whoever among you without sin let him stone her and the scripture tells us that they all left so there are many times that you try to test Jesus by asking question uh, to see if he make an error if he make a mistake same thing Muhammad said in this hadith some Jew went to Muhammad and they asked him oh prophet of God tell us what is the highest mountain the greatest mountain we can ever see on planet earth and Muhammad said hmm, piece of cake it is mountain cough mountain cough that's why God in the Quran swear by mountain cough and he swear by the Quran really would you please Prophet Muhammad give us a little bit more information about this mountain you're talking about he said yes it is uh, surround the earth Imagine with me, the earth is flat. And this mountain is like the fence, it's the border, it is a, 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 the wall go around the earth. And he said, uh, from this mountain, the greenness of the, the shadow of the mountain on earth, it make it look green. He said that it will take you 500 years to go up to the top of the mountain. 500 years traveling. He also said that to cross the bottom of this mountain, it would take you 1,000 years. 1,000 years to cross the bottom, 500 years to go up to the top of the mountain. What a mighty mountain! Do you know that if you are in your 70s, 80s, walking slow, you can walk around the earth a good 12, 13 times in less than 1,000 years? And when Muhammad described this mountain with this great detail, the Jewish people who went to ask him, they become a Muslim. They say, we bear a witness, you are an apostle of God, for no man can give us exact details of this mountain cough unless he is a true prophet. What happened to this mountain? A mountain 13 times bigger than planet Earth, set on the edge of the Earth. What happened to it? It is blah, blah, blah. Muhammad sit and people come around him and he talk and they believe him. Nobody argue with him because you know what? And he is a true prophet. And here is a Jew. Believe in Muhammad because he describes this great mountain calf which Allah swear by in the Quran. There is no such a thing as a mountain. It doesn't exist. It's just another error in the Quran. Botanical mistakes in the Quran. This is a... When you do a search on planets, study planets, and see where planets grow in which part of the world. 
There is, a, there is a great science about botanical. And, and these are the people who will tell you, this plant will grow up here and does not grow up here. And it's better to plant the corn in this time of the year. It's better to do this. I mean, these people are doing a great job. And now we have a watermelon, yellow, no red, without seed, with seed, different fruit with seed, different fruit without seed. You can mix some, some fruit. It's a great science. Do you know that the Quran have an error also about planets? Listen to the next verse, please. So we produce to you by it gardens of palm trees and grapes. You have in it much fruits, and from it you eat. And the tree that grows up on Mount Sinai, which yields oil and a juice for eaters. A tree bring oil grew on the top of Mount Sinai. I don't think Muhammad never been in Mount Sinai. It is granite. It still exists today. It is granite, solid mountain. You can't grow olive tree on top of Mount Sinai. Maybe in Jerusalem you have olive tree. Maybe somewhere else, but not, trust me, not on the top of Mount Sinai. It is a granite. Go look on the line. Go online and research for Mount Sinai. Watch it. It is granite solid mountain. You cannot grow an olive tree on top of Mount Sinai. It's just another error in the Quran. Historical. You know the Bible is a book, it's not a book of history. But when you read the Bible, everywhere you go in the Bible, you will find history to be true. When the Bible talks about history, it is 100% true. And every work has been done by geological and other people proves that the Bible is a correct history, even if it's not a history book. So it's the Quran. You see, Muhammad in the Quran is copying the Bible. The Bible has so many history and so many stories, and Muhammad took it from the Quran, from the Bible, and put it in the Quran. And as he rewriting the Bible in the Quran, he put himself in so many, he make himself so many error or mistake. Let me share with you some of the historical mistakes or errors in the Quran. So the family of Pharaoh picked him up so that he may become an enemy to them and a grief. Surely Pharaoh and Haman and their troops were sinners. You know, all over the Quran, Muhammad never really mentioned names. He always would tell you one of them tell the other, and that would go for it. He never mentioned names, and when he mentioned names, he get himself in trouble, like in this verse. Pharaoh and Haman together in Egypt? Where do we find Haman in the Bible? Oh, that's in the book of Esther. It's a complete different kingdom in complete different time. Hundreds of years apart between Pharaoh and Haman. But Muhammad in the Quran, he make Haman and Pharaoh together in the Egyptian kingdom. Or may somebody say, well, maybe there was a man by the name Haman in the time of Pharaoh. No, there is no such a thing as Haman as a name for the Egyptian. It's like you cannot go search in, in the history of the President of the United States and you come to the conclusion that there was a president by the name Fat. Or you go to Saudi Arabia and study about the kingdom of Saudi and you find one of the uh, uh, names of the kings of Saudi Arabia by the name John Smith. It does not work. Haman, the only Haman, exists in the Bible, obviously in the book of Esther. And Muhammad, by error, by mistake, mixed him with Pharaoh in the time of Moses. And Pharaoh said, O oh, you leaders, you have no other god that I know of but me. So kindle a fire to me, O Haman, on the clay. So make to me a tower, so perhaps I may go up to the god of Moses, and surely I think he is of the liars. And here we see that Haman here is commanded by Pharaoh to build Pharaoh a tower. Where do we find a tower in the Bible? Babel. Ham and Shem and Jeff is the three sons of Noah after they come out of the boat and they start to build the tower and that's where God touched their tongue and, and therefore they could not finish the job. The only tower that exists is the, Babel, the Tower of Babel. It is in Iraq, not in Egypt. It was in uh, uh, the time of the children of Noah, not in the time of Moses. No tower was built in Egypt for Pharaoh by Haman so that he may go up and sees the God of Moses. The story of the Samaritan. You see, as I share with you before, that so many times a Muslim reads the Quran and he found the story in the Quran different than the story in the Bible. And the first and the only conclusion they come up with is the Bible has been changed and the Bible has been corrupted. It must be. 
I mean, what do you expect? The Quran is wrong? No way. It must be the Bible is wrong. So we read the story about uh, 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 the Jewish people after they left Egypt and Moses went up to the mountain and Moses was late and 40 days is a long time and the Jewish people want to have a God so they ask Aaron to make them a God and so he makes them a cow. Uh, uh, God looked like a cow. Obviously, they picked this out of my own people in Egypt. We worship a cow and from gold, and they worship it and they dance before it. Who made the cow for the Jew to worship? It was Aaron. When you go on the Quran, somebody else. And obviously, the Bible is wrong and the Quran is true story. But so amazingly, let's think about how the story was written in the Quran and let's think about for a minute here can the Quran be true? Can the Quran be the true word of God? Maybe somebody changed the Bible, but can the Quran be true? Listen to the story in the Quran. He said, So surely indeed we led your people into sedition after you, and the Samaritans led them astray. So Moses returned to his people, angered, sorrowful. He said, O oh my people, did not your Lord promise you a good promise? Was the covenant so long to you, or you desired that wrath from your Lord should fall on you, so that you broke your promise to me? Notice that the verse begins by the statement that God Almighty, He tested, Fatana tested the Hebrew people after Moses. God sent people to sin and caused people to err so He can punish them. God, which the Bible is very clear, He will not test with evil in the Quran, all over the Quran, He tests people with sin to cause them to sin so He can send them to hell. God's desire in the Quran is he will fill hell with human and demons. That's what the Quran says. God in the Quran is a great deceiver who will deceive people to fall in sin so he can send them to hell. That's not my God. This must be Satan. But here he said, we tested your people and how he tests them by causing the Samaritan to do what he did. And what did the Samaritan do? Listen to the rest of the story. They said, We did not break your promise by our choice, but we carry loads of the people's trinkets. So we threw them, so likewise the Samaritan threw. So this gave forth a calf to them, a body which had a mooing sound. So they said, This is your God and the God of Moses. So he forgot. Notice here the Jewish people are telling Moses that we did not break the law by our choice. This is God, your God, who tested us. We got all this gold and ornament from Egypt and we give him to the Samaritan and the Samaritan make a cow out of it. And you know what? It's an amazing cow. It's really a miraculous cow. Anybody should be there should worship this cow. Why? Because not only God tested them, tempted them to make the cow, he even made a miracle in the cow. The cow was a mowing sound. Wow. Can you imagine you see a gold cow and the cow making a noise like a real cow? Why not you worship it? That's a miracle itself. Samaritan made the cow and the Jewish people worship the cow and they fall into the adultery sin of worshiping other gods. They will become idol worshiper. And God is the one who did it. But let's think a minute here. Think with me for a minute here. Samaritan. When did the Samaritan people exist? Uh, 700 to 750 years after Moses left Egypt. How can he have a Samaritan before he have the Samaritan, the Samaritan as a country? How can he have American before he discover America? See, the story has been written by a big mistake from Muhammad because he claimed that the Samaritan was there in Moses' time when they left Egypt and the people did not exist for at least another 700 years. Well, I'm sorry. I'll take the story of the Bible. The Bible said Aaron, no Samaritan, and the Quran is wrong. Simply, at least, because Samaritan people don't, did not exist until 700 years later after Moses died. Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran is the word of God? Why we see these errors all over the Quran? Is Mary the mother of Jesus, is the same Mary the sister of Moses and Aaron? Can't be. But listen to the verses of the Quran. And Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private parts, so we breathed into it from our spirit, and she believed in the words of her Lord and his books, and she was among the obedient.
Mary, the daughter of Imran. We know from the Bible that Moses' sister, her name is Mary, and she, uh, her daddy's name is not Imran with the letter N, but Imran with the letter M. Muhammad changed a little bit from M to N, he make it Amran, and he called it Mary, daughter of Imran. And don't forget here in this verse, our spirit. You know, Muslim people reject the Trinity so bad. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. They don't believe in the Trinity because they believe God is one. That's wonderful. We Christians believe God is one in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As you read the Quran, you find all over the Quran, Muhammad talk about God, Spirit. The Holy Spirit, our spirit, all over the Quran. And when you ask Muslim scholar, who is our spirit? When God say our spirit, what does he mean? They come up with 19 different explanation. What is the spirit of God is? Some say the spirit of God is the word of the Quran. Some say the spirit of God is the word of the Torah. Some say the spirit of God is the word of the Injil. Some say the, the spirit of God is some angel, some, some creature. And the most of them agree that the spirit of God is angel Gabriel. Really? But you go to some other verses in the Quran, uh, for example, when God commands uh, angels to worship Adam. So he said, so God commands all the angels to worship Adam. So all the angels worship Adam except Satan. When this happened? When God put his spirit into Adam. God put angel Gabriel inside Adam. And then angel Gabriel worshiped Adam while he was inside Adam. Uh-uh-uh. Muhammad did not know what is the Spirit. Muhammad did not know what is the Holy Spirit. Muhammad have no clue what is our Spirit. In simple word, the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, which is the second part of our, uh, the, our belief in the third part of our Trinity, the Christian faith. And Muhammad have no clue about the one God because it doesn't exist in Islam. There are two, at least, God and His Spirit. And the Spirit of God in the Quran cannot be angel Gabriel as we have just described. So, Mary, daughter of Imran. I'm sorry, that's not the real name of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Notice this next verse as well. O sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man, and your mother was not unchaste. In chapter 19, verse 28, uh, when Mary, she carried uh, baby Jesus on her arm and she went to her family and they were surprised, shocking how shameful it is for you to bring a baby. Shame on you, girl. You become an adulterer or a fornicator. How can you do that? And what the Quran said, O oh, sister of Aaron, your brother was not a wicked nor your mother was a, a, a terrible woman. Y you sister of Aaron. And, and so many Muslim scholars really have no answer because I totally believe Muhammad was confused between Mary, the sister of Aaron, and, 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 and Moses, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he thinks they are the same woman. Sister of Aaron. So some Muslim scholars said, wait a minute, she used to have a brother by the name Aaron. Well, you know what? When you read the Bible and you understand the background of the scripture, you find out there's no way Mary have a brother. She was a single daughter to her daddy by the name Heli, not Imran, and she was not the sister of Aaron. Oh, somebody said, well, when, when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, Aaron, when Mary was living, there were thousands of people, Aaron, righteous people, and when somebody died by the name Aaron, people just carry the name, and they make up story and story like the Quran is written. Try to find an answer for this problem. The problem is very simple. Muhammad is confused between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the sister of Moses and Aaron, period. The Bible says in Luke 3, 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Joseph, the son of Heli. What do you learn from that? Joseph, daddy, was not Heli, but Joseph's step uh, father in law, his name is Heli. So, Mary, daughter of Heli. Why is the Bible clearly tell us here in Luke that? Joseph was called the son of Heli because the culture tells us if a man does not have a son and his daughter married to a son, he will be called the father of the son. Mary did not have a brother by the name Aaron and she was a girl to a mom and dad and when she married Joseph, Joseph was called 
by her father's name that he became his son. And this is the tradition and the culture in the Jewish faith. And her daddy's name is Heli, not Imran, as Muhammad said in the Quran. This is just another error in the Quran. So many errors in the Quran. You know, as you read the Quran, you found out so about uh, Pharaoh and Moses. So amazing. Muhammad repeats the story of Moses and Pharaoh and the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, which obviously clearly written in the Bible, in the book of Exodus. He repeats the story in the Quran 27 times. And every time he changes the word a little bit here, a little bit there, and a little bit here, a little bit there, to make it a little bit, you know, you, get, you don't get tired of hearing the story over. So he changed the word, which make it a contradictory uh, document. Did this happen before or did it happen after? Did it happen, did he drown or did he drown? So as example, the crossing of the Red Sea in the Quran, Muhammad puts the story in many places, of course, and he contradicts himself. Listen to the story. Did Pharaoh drown when he crossed the Red Sea after the uh, Hebrew people left Egypt or he did not drown? Did he drown as an infidel or he did, did he drown as a believer? He did not drown as a believer. Listen to the verses of the Quran. And we brought the children of Israel through the sea. So Pharaoh and his hosts followed them insolently and with enmity until when he was about to drown, he said, I believe that there is no God but him on whom the children of Israel believed, and I am of the Muslims. You see, Pharaoh here is about to drown, and he shout, I believe in God. I believe there's only one God, the God of Moses. I believe. As before he drowned. You know what's so amazing? <laughs> because uh, Muslim scholars tried to make Moses did not believe. And it's, it's, they tried to change this verse here. I read Muslim scholar, believe me, they are just full of stupidity and foolishness. They tell you when Moses, when, when Pharaoh shout, I believe in God, quickly, angel Gabriel run to the depths of the sea and he gets some mud and he put in his mouth so God cannot hear his repentance. Muslim people believe in that, that God did not hear it. Muhammad knew it, me and you know it, but God did not know it because quickly Angel Gabriel put the mud in his mouth and he was not able to say, I believe. Hey, he said it, but God didn't hear it. Isn't this amazing? The rest of the story is, Now and indeed you disobeyed before and you were of the vandals. So today we will deliver you with your body that you may become a sign to those who come after you. And surely most people are unaware of our signs. Here God is speaking in verse 91, 92 in chapter 10. And God is clearly telling that he saved his body. Or some Muslim scholars said, no, he did not save his body. His body did not, uh, you know, uh, 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 fall apart and the fish did not eat his body. His body flew on the top of the water. So, the, so everybody saw him and everybody knows that he drowned. So no fear anymore. Fear is no longer alive. That's what he meant. But literally, he did drown, but he did not, his body was not eaten by the fish. His body did not fall apart. That's what the Quran meant. Well, I'm sorry. That's not the truth. According to the Bible, he drowned and he died and his body fallen apart. Some uh, scientists in, in, in Europe become a Muslim because he found the Pharaoh, which the Quran is talking about, and he found his body. Which one? Did you talk to the Pharaoh and he told you, I am the one who drowned in the water? It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Most of people try to come up with answer for every problem. And they bring you scientists from Europe. He become a Muslim because he saw the body. And this proves that the Quran verse is true. I'm sorry, the Quran is wrong. At least in this verses we read here in chapter 10, we found out that Pharaoh believed in God and God saved his body. As uh, I believe the verse clearly is that he did not drown. Another place, he may be uh, drowned, but his body did not eaten by fish as Muslim scholar claim. How about this next verse? And he became proud with his troops in the land without the truth. And they thought that they will not return to us. So we seized him and his troops, so we cast them into the sea. So see how was the end of the unjust. How was the end of the unjust? How was the end of the wicked Pharaoh? He drowned. God did not save him, not by his body, not by his bones. God seized him and his people into the water. He never believed. He never said anything about God or the God of Moses. He drowned as an infidel unjust. 
and here is a contradiction in the Quran in one place Moses believed another place he did not believe and he drowned just as an infidel and this is the end of the unjust and God seized him and his followers his army into the water what does the Bible says in Psalm 136 15 but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. As uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 136, as you read in the New Testament, all over the scriptures, there's a, there's a continuing straight line, one story, Pharaoh drowned, and he no longer lived, and he was not a believer. He never believed in God, the God of Moses, or any God at all. Here is a story I shared to you a little bit early about Noah's son. Let's read it together from the Quran. And it sailed on with them amid waves like mountains. And Noah called to his son, and he was apart. O oh, my son, embark with us, and do not be with the infidels. Here's Noah in the, in the ark, and the ark starts moving, and it moves a little bit, a little bit, the middle wave, and here's Noah's son down there. He is what? In the water. Not inside the ark, not with his daddy and his family as the scripture teach, but he's outside there swimming. Listen to the rest of the story. He said, I will take refuge to a mountain that will secure me from the water. He said, No one will be secure today from the command of Allah except him on whom he will have mercy. And the waves passed between them, so he was among the drowned. Noah's son drowned in the water. As the waves came between him and his daddy, and his daddy is begging him to come, he's thinking he can go up to the top of the mountain and he'll be safe, but he is not. He drowned. What a perfect guidance. What a wonderful Quran. Read the Bible. It's very clearly, Noah have no sons drowned. As a matter of fact, when you read the stories of the Quran, which is taken out of the Bible, it is missing so much. Imagine with me, the Quran is like uh, this uh, piece of puzzles you put together. A thousand pieces, you take them one next one next one, you come up with a beautiful, you end with a beautiful picture. Can you imagine if I give you a box of 1,000 pieces of puzzle, but I'm going to take out of it 800 or 750 pieces and throw them in the trash can. And I'm going to only give you seven, uh, from, from a thousand pieces, 250 or, or 300 pieces. And none of these pieces stick together. I mean, it's like separated one. And good luck. Tell me what is the story. Good luck to put these pieces together to tell me what Muhammad is trying to say. This is all over the Quran. For those who speak highly of the Quran, they need to read the Bible so they figure out what they do have in their hand. When you read the Quran, you could not have a clue who is Noah. I mean, you ask the same question. I have my son, 10 years old, and I'm going to put in my left hand some Muslim scholar. I'm going to ask the same question. How old was Noah when he built the ark? My son will tell me. Muslim scholars say, only God knows. Okay, how long did it take him to build the ark? My son will tell me. Muslim scholars, they have no clue. Who, was, uh, who, who enters the, the boat? How, how many male and female of clean bird and unclean bird? My son will tell me. Muslim scholars do not know. How long did it take him to build the ark? My son will tell me. Muslim scholars do not know. How long did it takes the water to drop it from the sky and coming from the earth? My son will tell me. And Muslim scholars do not know. Where, where is the ark rested? My son will tell me the right place. And Muslim scholars will tell me the wrong mountain. And, and what happened before and what happened after? No answer in the Quran. You ask Muslim scholars, they will clearly tell you. Only God knows. Why? Because the story lost so much information and just Muhammad repeated over and over and over again in the Quran, gather all the Quran, all what Muhammad talked about Noah, you come up to the conclusion to answer simple question a 10 years old child can answer, Muslim scholar will tell you only God knows. Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran the word of God? Forget about this error, this error we're sharing. Can you really understand the Quran by simply reading the Quran? Or do you need to read the Bible to understand the Quran? In every story, every story in the Quran is being copied from the Bible and changed and missing so much information. And only God knows the answer. That's why in chapter 4 in the Quran, the Quran says, no one understands its interpretation but Allah. Only God knows what does the Quran mean by what they said. So why God gives the Quran to the people? Of course, as I shared with you before, 
the son which Muhammad claimed that he had drowned in the flood according to the Muslim scholar is Kenan and obviously when you read the Bible you find out Kenan son of Ham was not born until after the flood so here is a Muslim scholar instead of they fix a problem in the Quran they add more water to the mud of the Quran literally the moment you hear the scholar interpret some verse you know they're gonna make up something most likely it's, it's gonna it's not gonna be right it's gonna be wrong the mixing of names in the Quran Remember I told you early, Muhammad, when he tell us a story, he never really mentioned any names. Because when he tell a story and mention names, he gets himself in trouble. So in two different locations of the Quran, Muhammad is quoting or naming the prophets, which he claimed to be a prophet all over the Quran. And it's very strange, very strange order. I never thought that this would be verse in the Quran. You have no clue who came first and who came second. In the Quran, you read the Quran, you just, it's, it's like a, a nice dish of salad. Cucumber and tomato and lettuce and all mixed together. Literally, you cannot find any Muslim scholar. I'm not talking about simple Muslim people in the street. The 87% of the Muslim people, over a billion, who never read the Quran. I'm talking about the scholar. The one who claimed to know the Quran right and left. You could not get one of them to give you the names of the prophet in the right order. One of the tests I have in Old Testament survey in New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in, in, the, in the bachelor and in the master's degree. Both way, when you take an Old Testament survey, you have to put the names of the prophet in the right order with the date. So I'm going to tell you Elisha, Jonah, Moses, Abraham, a bunch of names, and you have to put them in the right order and when every one of them exists. I would love to give the same test to the Muslim scholar. I would love to give it to Muhammad himself. Well, guess what? He has no answer. He does not know who came first. Was Moses before Jesus or Jesus before? I mean, it's a chaos. And here is the verse of the Quran. Listen to the order of the verses Muhammad put in the Quran. And you tell me if Muhammad have a clue who came first. And we granted to him Isaac and Jacob and guided both. And Noah we guided before, and among his descendants, David and Solomon and Job and Joseph and Moses and Aaron. And likewise we reward the doers of good. And Zechariah and John and Jesus and Elijah, all were from the good. And Ishmael and Elisha and Jonah and Lot. And we prefer all those above the worlds. Can any Muslim really tell us what kind of order Muhammad have here in the Quran for the names of these people? It's a chaos because literally Muhammad have no clue who came first and who came second. And it's just another verses of the Quran. Is the Quran in Bible? Is the Quran the true word of God? If I can bear the Quran to the Bible about this list of names where Muhammad puts in verses in the Quran, does, do Muslim scholars have a clue who came first and who came second? Absolutely no idea. Read the Bible. Read the Holy Scripture. The Bible will tell you who came first and who came second. How old he was when he became a king. What happened in his kingdom. When did he die? History. The true history is in the Bible, not in the Quran, because Muhammad have no clue about the dates of the people. Moral mistakes in the Quran. The Quran is full of error, mistakes morally. It's supposed to be, when you receive a word from God, you're supposed to receive a word from God to help you to be living pure, to live holy, to live godly, to live as what God wants you to be. When we read the Quran and live with the Quran, will we become holy people? In their translation to the Quran, some of them said, the holy Quran. If you live with the Quran, will you become holy? Will you live holy as God wants us to be? If you practice every verse and every word of the Quran, you'll be far, far away from holiness. Literally, the Quran teaches to live unmorally, but they consider the Quran to be the holy book, the holy word of Allah. Let's hear what the verses of the Quran teach about moral issues. And think with me, my dear Muslim friend, think with me, brother and sister. Can this be God's word? Will God's word teach people to do such a thing? Let's watch this together. Whoever becomes an infidel in Allah after he believed, 
except one who was compelled and his heart is secure in faith. But whoever opens his chest to the infidelity, the wrath of Allah will be on them and they will have great torment. This verse teaches it is lawful to deny your faith. If somebody forces you in your own situation, it's okay to deny your faith as long as you believe in your heart. Isn't that what Muslims are doing in America today? They're denying the verses of the Quran, they're denying the belief which Allah has given them, and they become a friend to the Jew and the Christian. They will tell you in your face, we love you. As a matter of fact, if, if there's any some trouble, they will deny they're Muslim. It's okay to deny your faith in the time of hardship. That's not faith. That's not how the church begins. That's not how the church strongly grew. It grew by the blood of the martyrs, those who were killed for Jesus. Muslim in America today, very friendly, very nice people. But 20 years from now, the true Islam will show up. If you don't believe me, just look at Europe. Europe 30 years ago was so peaceful, loving Islam. People who believe in Islam in Europe 30 years ago, they have done everything anybody would love to have from a neighbor or a people. But today, Muslims in Europe are burning Europe. They're burning France, they're destroying England, they're destroying Ireland. All over Europe we have a chaos. Why? Because they're no longer in a hardship time. They can do anything and they will do everything, even denying their faith as a hardship, as long as they believe in their heart. It's okay to deny you're a Muslim as long as you believe in your heart. What does the Bible teach about that? But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Jesus said clearly in Luke 12, 9, you do not deny him before men because the moment you deny him before men, he himself will deny you before God. You spend eternity in hell if you deny your faith. That's why all the disciples of Jesus were killed except John. That's why early church has been persecuted and people die for their faith. And that's how the church grew by the blood of the murder. Those who had murder for Jesus. No Christian, no true believer will deny his faith in the time of persecution. But in Islam, it's okay to deny your faith as long as you believe in your heart. And God knows what's in your heart. Swearing in the Quran. So amazing. How Muhammad in the Quran swear by everything. Notice in chapter 89 verse 1 to 5, Allah, God, is swearing by some stuff. Let's watch it here. I swear by the dawn, and by the ten nights, and by the even and the odd, and by night when it departs. Is there not an oath in this to one who possesses a stone? What an oath for those who have some common sense, possess understanding. God swearing by the day and the night, the earth and the heaven and star and, and all this, uh, the odd and the, the equal number. He's swearing by one, three and five and two and four and six. Why God will swear by stuff where he said, do not swear. Is the one who said the rules break it? All over the Quran, as we read a little bit early, that God swear by mountain K. Here God swearing by these issues. And later God swear. I mean, read the last, especially the last part of the Quran, uh, the poetry. God is swearing by one thing after one thing. God loved to swear in the Quran. What does the Bible teach about swearing? Let's see what Jesus says. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Notice that the Quran clearly tells us the opposite of what Matthew or what Jesus said in Matthew. Jesus said, don't swear by heaven or earth or anything, not by your head, not by anything. And Muhammad all over the Quran said that Allah is swearing by all these things. The Bible clearly says anything above yea and nay, it is from evil. Therefore, the Quran is from evil. Because the Quran clearly teach what? To swear by all these things which God and Jesus said 
not to swear by. Anything above yea and nay is evil. And the Quran has so many verses where God swears by things right and left. The Quran is not the word of God. The Quran is not infallible. It's fall of error. Allah will not hold you responsible for your mere utterance in an oath, but he will hold you responsible for that which your hearts gained. And Allah is forgiving, forbearing. Not only Allah allow people to swear in Islam, he allowed them to lie in their swearing. Did you really mean it? Did you really say that deep from your heart? Then it's okay. If you don't mean it, then it's okay. It's okay to swear, it's okay to lie in your swearing, as long, you know, your heart is sincere about it. If you, don't, if you, if you really, really, really didn't mean it, it's okay. I'm sorry. That's not the word of God. God say, don't swear. God say, don't lie. O oh, you prophet, provoke the believers to engage in war. If there will be 20 patient ones of you, they will have victory over 200. It is lawful to kill. That's how you're going to get gained. That's how you're going to be rich. That's how you're going to take over the world. Oh, Muhammad provokes the believers, the Muslim, to fight. So amazing. American people, it's been six years now, and I have not seen in all my traveling. This year alone, I've spoken 105 church or 106 church in 13 states, and I have not seen yet some American believer, Baptist or non Baptist believer, who bought the Quran and read the Quran to know the truth about Islam. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims, and what do they believe? Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace and that Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors, immoral teachings, and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoated, they watered it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran. We must separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verse of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy-to-follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament, and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. 
And the media present Islam to be the loving, peaceful religion. And how, what was the result of this? Six, uh, in the last six years, three million Americans become Muslim. And if you ask any of these millions of Americans who become Muslim, 500,000 a year, they will tell you Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. Have they read the Quran? No. Have they understood the Hadith? No. Why they are Muslim? Because they doubt the truth about the scripture, the Holy Bible. And what does the Quran teach? Oh, prophet, provoke the believer to love one another. No, to fight. If there's 20 steadfast, they shall take over 100. And if 100, they take, shall take over 1,000. Provoke the Muslim to fight. When you go to the book of Hebrew, the Bible clearly said, let's provoke one another into love and do good works. Why is the Holy Bible, the Holy Scripture, the true Word of God, provoke one another as believers, as Christians, to love and do good work? Muhammad is commanded the Quran to provoke the believers to go out and kill. And the Bible is very clearly, thou shalt not kill. Kill who? Read the Quran. Kill the Jew and the Christian. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rasha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. While well, Muhammad commanding his followers to kill others, the Bible is very clearly Jesus said, you could not even sell to your brother a fool. You don't hurt your brother feeling, not kill him and shed his blood. See the difference between the Bible, the word of God, and the Quran? The word of Satan? Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran, is the word of God? The Quran teach to kill. And know that whatever you take of spoil of anything, so a fifth part to Allah and to the Messenger. That's how the Muslim people become rich. This is the business they were uh, working with in Muhammad days. Not uh, being farmers or being salesmen or being whatever work people did at this time. No, they were getting rich by the spoil. And Muhammad even got richer because he only get 20%, uh, one-fifth. So they lay away, besiege to the infidel, Christian Jew, Jump on them, kill them, stealing their money, taking their home, and uh, taking their money, and, uh, and terrorizing, as uh, it's written in chapter 33, in the Quran, verse 26 and 27. And that's how they become rich. They inherited land they do not own. They take homes they have nothing to do with. And they got riches of the money. And Muhammad got 20%. Spoil of the war. It's okay to kill, and it's okay, it's okay to get rich by taking the people you kill money, lands, and homes. So eat of the spoils you have taken lawfully and good, and fear Allah. Surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. The spoil in the Quran, in Islam, is lawful and good. Enjoy it. We go next town here in Bradenton and attack the people in Bradenton and kill all the men there. Take the children, take the woman as slave, take their home, take their land, take their animals, all their camel and all the sheep and everything they own there. And it is lawful and good. Let's enjoy it. Have fun with it. Don't forget to give Muhammad 20% of it. The spoil in Islam, in the Quran, is lawful and good. Spoil, including land. Spoil is money. Spoil is children. Spoil is women. It is spoil. Lawful and good. Thou shalt not steal. When the Bible clearly said you need to work hard by the sweat of your faith, you can eat food and you need to work hard and be a, a, an earning man for your, for your uh, income and everything, Islam teaches it's okay to steal. Spoil is steal after a murder. And this is the truth about the Quran. Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran is the word of God? Will the Quran, if the Quran was the word of God, will it teach such a moral life to kill people and steal their money? And tell me it is lawful and good? The forbidden month for the forbidden month and all the forbidden things are retaliation. 
So whoever commits transgression against you, so transgress against him, similar to how he transgressed against you. And fear Allah, and know that Allah is with the fearer. It's okay to revenge. This is what the Quran teach. Is this morally right? Somebody harm you, harm him back, equal to what you, he harm you? We go back from Mosaic law with the justice, to the love of God, to revenge. Back to the dirt, barbarian way of life. You take your life by your own hands. It's lawful in the Quran to revenge. That's not God's word. That's not something you come up with after what Jesus taught in the New Testament. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man shall sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. I would love to see some passage like this in the Quran. But guess what? It is not there. I read the Quran the last two years at least 15 times in my translation. 15 or 16 times. And I never found a quote like what Jesus taught in Matthew. About love. About forgiveness. About being like, like your father who are in heaven. This is the true word of God. When Jesus spoke his word, every word come out of Jesus' mouth was the word of God. And every word come out of the Quran is, you tell me. If it's not Satan's words, who, who is behind these verses? Who is behind all this hate and killing and shed of blood? If the Muslim people just read the Quran one time, without the prejudice glasses, just read it and go back to the Bible and read it. You will find for yourself that the Quran is not the word of God and it is not the truth. Is the Quran infallible? That's a question we ask. And if you fear that you cannot deal fairly among the orphans, so marry what appeals to you from the women, two and three and four. So if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one wife or have sex with what your right hand possesses. This is near that you may not have hardship. Marriage is the most holy union God Almighty has put into the Bible. A man leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and they both become one flesh. When you read and study about marriage in Islam, it's a complete different story. I don't know how you can call the Quran a holy book and after what you learn about marriage in Islam. For example, as we read in this verse, a man has the right to marry up to four of the free Muslim women. This is one kind of marriage. The second kind of marriage in Islam is the marriage to the concubine, the slave, what your right hand possesses, unlimited number. You see, Muslim in America read the first half of this verse and they stop. Tell them, keep reading. Tell me more. What is the rest of the verse says? If you cannot treat them fairly, that's a free Muslim woman, you marry one. But don't stop there, please. Keep reading. What is the next verse? And all what your right hand possessed. That's a slave and concubine. Yes, Quran teaches it's okay to have slave. Yes, Islam teaches it's okay to have unlimited number of slaves. That's why, until today, your Christian sisters all over Africa are sold to the Muslim countries and they're buying them day and night I saw them by my own eye three years ago when I went to Kuwait we were in Kuwait airport at uh, 2 30 in the morning and a long line of girls seven eight years old maybe 20 years old long line black girls stand in line and three men with a stick in their hand hit them in the shoulder and say stand up straight stand up straight and my heart was aching inside me. And I know this is a line of slave. But I was in a mission trip, having uh, three other gentlemen with me from America here, and we supposed to have 7,000 Bible with us taken to Baghdad, and I could not open my mouth. I kept my mouth shut, but my heart inside was burning. I want to go and ask them, where are you from? Who bought you? How much did they pay for you? And where are you going? 
I know and I know and I know this is a line of slave. Just recently in Egypt, they have this TV show where this lady interviews this mufti, the greatest imam. And she asks him the question. You can see this very clearly in, uh, in many different TV, sh uh, YouTube and other places. And she asks him the question. Does Islam teach slavery? He refused to answer. She said, I want to know the truth from you. Does in Islam we can have slaves? Does Islam allow slavery? He refused to answer. And he get mad. And he, every time he said, well, I don't have any slave. We do not own slave right now. I think she said, I need to know what does the Quran teach about slavery? She caught him to the corner. Remember the movie, A Few Good Men? And in the end of this movie, when the lawyer was so smart, he squeezed him hard and he said, I want to know the truth. And, he, and then this, uh, the other uh, actor, he said, you can't handle the truth, son. Remember this movie? This is exactly what happened in this show. This man, the mufti in Egypt, told this uh, lady, she has an interview, you can't handle the truth. She said, I want to know the truth. He said, yes, we have the right to have any infidel as slave. Allah gave us the right to have the Christian and the Jew and anybody else who does not believe in Islam to be our slave. It is our given right by Allah in the Quran. The Quran teach it's okay to have slave. The Quran teach it's okay to marry, not holy marry, to have sex with a slave woman even if she is married to another man. What a holy book! It's okay to sleep with your slave if she have, even if she have another husband. That's what the Quran teaches. Another marriage in Islam is what we call uh, marriage for fun, the wajil muta. And in this marriage, a man can marry a woman for a limited time, for a limited number of dollars. That's what we call in America prostitution. In the Holy Quran, it's a marriage. Shia practice this marriage. All Irani, all Syri, all Yemeni, all people in Lebanon, Hezbollah, all Muslim in America who are Shia, they still until today in our country marry one another or marry somebody else for fun. A uh, couple hours, 20 bucks or 50 bucks. A uh, couple weeks for $300. And they consider this a holy marriage. Can the Quran be morally a book sent by God? Is the Quran in Fabo teach such a way? And there's so many other kind of marriage. There's a marriage uh, misyar. That's if you're traveling and you have a wife somewhere uh, and you're traveling for another long time, you can't wait a couple of weeks or three weeks to, to go back to your wife, then you get yourself a wife, uh, just uh, you go by her once a year or so. So many different marriages. And I, wanna, I don't want to get into detail. It is unmoral book. Believe me, read the Quran. Get my copy and read it, and you'll find the truth for yourself. The Quran is not a moral book. The Quran is not the Word of God. Is the Quran in Fabo? What does the Bible teach about this issue here? Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is the holy marriage. This is the holy union. A man leave his father and his mother, unite with his wife, one flesh. You don't look at the woman by your eyes to lust. It's sin to look at the woman next to you only your wife to look at and in Islam unlimited number of wives all the slave and uh, and concubine marriage for fun marriage uh, traveling marriage and all these different names I think the truth is clearly there the Bible is the Word of God the Quran is not there are so many error especially when we talk about moral issue as marriage the holy union between a one man and a one woman, the one flesh deal is not in the Quran. You could not find it anywhere in the Quran. The theological error or mistakes in the Quran. 
Muhammad in his own writing as he goes through the Quran he uh, emphasizes on one thing which is the denial of the Trinity or the denying of the true faith of the Christian faith for who God is Father Son Holy Spirit so we see in chapter 5 uh, verse 116 the Quran says and when Allah said O Jesus son of Mary did you say to the people take me and my mother as two gods other than Allah he said Praise be to you. It is not for me that I say what is not true for me. If I had said it, so indeed you know it. You would know what is in my soul, and I do not know what is in your soul. Surely you are the knower of the unseen. One of the difficulty where Muslim people uh, see in uh, reading on reading the scripture when God asks a question in the Bible. You see this in so many writings, especially in these days, and they are using these uh, books to cause this American Christian and others to uh, 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 not accepting, not believing in the Bible to be the word of God. So they go in Genesis, for example, and they see that God tell Adam, where are you at? Or God is still in Canaan, where is your brother? Or whatever question God asks in the Bible. Not knowing that if they continue reading in the scripture, they will come to the conclusion that God knew the answer for the question. But God asking the question for one reason, and one reason only is because he want Adam to repent of his sin. Because he want Cain to confess that he killed his brother. But it's amazingly, when you see God in the Quran do the same thing. And here, for example, in 5, 116, we see that clearly in the Quran, God is asking question. So if God asks question in the Bible, it's no good. But if God asks question in the Quran, it's okay. It is not an error in the case uh, of God asking questions in the Quran. Here is God asking a strange question. It's really weird that God in the Quran asks us a question because he is asking the wrong question to the wrong person. Imagine with me if you go to the Bible and God is asking Adam, where is your son? Or God is asking Cain, who are, did you eat from the tree which I command you not to eat from? Asking the wrong question to the wrong person. Here in the Quran, 5, 1, 16, God is talking to Isa, Jesus. And what did God say? His question was, did you tell the people to take you and your mother, Mary, as God? Did Jesus really ever taught that? When we study the scriptures, the Holy Bible, do we find anywhere in the scripture Jesus tells the people to worship him and his mother? We know from the scripture that Jesus accepts worship by his disciples, but not to him and his mother, him alone, because he is God who came in flesh. But here in the Quran, God is asking a strange question. Obviously, we know in Muhammad days, the 6th century uh, or 7th century, some uh, of the Arab or some of the close people to him were worshipping Mary. And this is what we call the Mariamin. Those are the people who worship Mary as God. But you could not find anywhere in the early church, in Jesus' days, the first three, fourth century, anybody who worshipped Mary. It's a question put by Muhammad for one purpose. And one purpose only is... To deny the deity of Christ and he was confused about is Mary also a true God or not continue with what the Quran teaches about the denying of the Trinity in chapter 4 verse 171 the Quran says surely the Christ Jesus son of Mary is only a messenger of Allah and his word which he cast to Mary and a spirit from him so believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three surely Allah is only one God praise be to him that there would be to him a son very clearly the Quran denying the sonship the deity of Christ in 4171 you know one of the scene all over the Quran as I study the Quran as I read the Quran the one consistency Muhammad have is the denying of the deity of Christ sometime even in places where he is he's not supposed to be talking about the deity of Christ so imagine with me, Muhammad is talking about the grass. The grass is green. And he adds the statement, and Jesus is not the son of God. He'll be talking about the rain, and it was raining, and a blessing coming from heaven. And by the way, Jesus is not the son of God. And he'll be talking about the weather is good. And by the way, he insists. That's one of the scenes which he is continuing teaching all over the Quran, that Jesus is not the son of God. The denial of the deity of Christ. What about the response from the Bible? What do the Bible teach about the deity of Christ? What does the Bible teach about Trinity, the Christian faith? Let's read 
what the scripture teach old testament and new testament in deuteronomy 6 4 the bible says hear o israel the lord our god is one lord therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh this was in genesis 2 24. obviously on reading the scripture we know the christian faith which is the judaism faith is a one god but the word one God is the word Ahad. It is not the one without part in it. And you see this clearly when we talk about the marriage between a man and a wife. Same words the scripture used for Hear, O Israel, our God's Elohim, plural, is one God. It's the same word one we use in the case of marriage. A man leave his father and his mother and unite with his wife. And they, that more than one, that two, are one. Imagine with me also one family, one nation. All this word one is meaning not singular but parts in. So the God we Christian believe is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to see this even clearly as we talk about uh, uh, other verses coming in our seminar. In 1 John 1.14, the clear verses of the New Testament which clearly teach about the one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We see it in 1 John 1.14, 1, 1, 1 and 1.14, and also we see it in Matthew 28.19. This is just two simple verses I'd like to share with you, and there's so much in the scripture to see and find the truth about the Christian faith. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. The Word of God was with God in the beginning, from the beginning, and the Word of God is God. You're going to see clearly verses of the Quran teach the same belief. But the word of God which was with God, which is the creator of everything, and you see in Genesis uh, 1, as is the same word of God who became flesh in chapter 1, verse 14, the book of John. God became flesh. Jesus is God who became a man. You can go to Philippians and read what Paul wrote there. We are not Christians who make uh, Jesus the prophet, the man, a God, but God Almighty, the all-powerful, became flesh in Jesus Christ. And the Word became flesh. Very clearly, in Matthew 28, 19, as Jesus uh, giving his last word to his disciples and to his followers, and that's what we continue to do the last uh, 2,000 years, and we'll continue to do until Christ can come back, that we teach, make disciples, baptize the new believers in the name, not in the names, but in the one name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We do not believe in three God. We believe in one God, and He is a triune God. In Surah 5, verse 69, Muhammad is giving us here a statement or a verse talking about the Sabaeans. Those are the people who worship idols, and there he speaks of them as they are another godly religion who worship God. Listen to the verses of the Quran. Surely those who believed, and those who are Jews, and the Sabaeans, and the Christians, whoever believed in Allah, and in the last day, and did a good deed, so there is no fear on them, and they will not grieve. Those who believe the Muslim, the Nasara is the Christian, the Jew, that's wonderful. These are what Muslim claim to be the three God religion, the one God religion, which I don't believe to be true. But Sabaeans? Sabi'un, those are the idol worshiper. Muhammad includes him with the Christian, with the Jew, with the Muslim. You see, Muhammad in the beginning of his claiming to be a prophet, he was trying to reach out to everybody. If you worship a cow, let me cut some grass for it, if you just believe in me. And how, that's how Muhammad was deceiving people from everywhere he can to make him believe in his religion. Isn't that what Muslims do in America today? 
What do Muslim people say? We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Angel, the Gospel. We believe in Moses. We believe in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Quran. They believe in everything. But the truth is, Islam teaches the only accepted religion by Allah is Islam. Otherwise, you are losers. They will not tell you that. They will not share with you these verses. They will go to other places in the Quran, which Muhammad used in his early part of his ministry, trying to be in peace with us. And the truth is in their books. It is written. Where we found the Quran. Where does the Quran come from? You know what? So one of the amazing verses in the Quran where Muhammad clearly tells us that his books is already exist. The Quran exists in early books. Listen to this verse. Surely, this is in the first pages of writing, the pages of writing of Abraham and Moses. Muhammad is telling that his Quran already exists in the early books, Abraham and Moses. Obviously, we do not have a books of Abraham. It never exists. Abraham never wrote any book. But Muhammad, in his imagination, he thought, well, Abraham wrote a book, Adam wrote a book, Alexander the Great wrote a book, everybody wrote a book, and everybody is a prophet. No, Abraham did not write anything. The early writing of our Holy Scripture is by Moses, 1550 years before Christ. Nothing was written as a scripture before that. Adam never wrote any books. Abraham never wrote any books. And so many, what Muhammad claimed to have books, never wrote any books. But Muhammad is telling us that his Quran come out of the old books. Like what? You see, when you read the Bible and you read the Quran, especially the Old Testament, you find out that Muhammad brought so many of the stories from the Quran, uh, taken from the Bible, put into the Quran in a corrupt form. Literally, there is not one story Muhammad told from the Bible, but in the Quran, and he kept it the same. He always changed him, shortened it up, repeated it over and over again. Even, he even changed his own word about the same story in the Quran as he continued to repeat the story over and over again. So he talked about the story of creation, Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and all the stories of the Bible repeated over and over in the Quran in a very corrupt form. The only way you find this for yourself, read the Bible and read the Quran. How about what he took out of the New Testament? He talked about the story of John the Baptist, Zechariah, Mary, Jesus, the disciples, the table. The descended table from heaven, as we're going to see a little bit here by God's will. So many stories taken out from the Bible in the Quran. And that's the real source of the Quran. Obviously, there are some other stories taken out from other books written in Muhammad days. And Muhammad thought uh, that it's a good story. He just added, for example, if you go to chapter 18 in the Quran, uh, the story of the caveman. It is not something happened it's an imagination story it's a story you tell to your children before bedtime and muhammad included in the quran thinking it's a true story one of the strange amazing things i found in the quran the worship of adam as uh, this story has been repeated so many times in the quran where god is commanding the angels to worship adam that's not my god my god is a jealous god who clearly teaches to him alone we must worship to him alone we must bow down but in the Quran, it's a very strange story. And when you hear the interpretation of Muslim scholar to such a story, you even, you even get more surprised that God did it on purpose so he makes Satan disobey him because Satan is going to be doing the right thing which not worshiping Adam and then Satan will be kicked out of heaven. Strange. Listen to the verse of the Quran in Surah 2 verse 34 and also in 7.11. And when we said to the angels, Worship Adam, so they all worshipped, except the devil. He refused and became proud, and he was among the infidels. And indeed, we created you, then we fashioned you, then we said to the angels, Worship Adam, so they worshipped, except the devil. He was not of those who worshipped. Will God command angels to worship Adam? The God who said, thou shalt not worship anyone but me, will he command his own angels, which he have created for one thing is to worship him, to worship Adam. Listen, let's listen to what the scripture teach, what the Bible teach about that. 
For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God, and he refused anybody to worship anybody but him. He will never command the angels to worship Adam. For whatever excuse Muslim scholar try to give to us. How about uh, his teaching of good deeds? Muhammad tells us that uh, there is other ways you can receive forgiveness of your sin. Just do some good work. You see, Islam faith is built on the pillar of Islam. And the pillar of Islam is all about work. The first work is to say the statement, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, and now, now you are a good Muslim. It's called shihada. And then you pray five times a day, and then you fast the month of Ramadan, and then you give zakat, and you visit Mecca. Do and do and do. All this good work will help you. I think the scripture teach something completely different than that. First, listen to the Quran, Surah 11, verse 114. And perform the prayer at the two edges of the day and at the approach of night. Surely good deeds drive away the evil deeds. Good deeds drive away the evil deeds. That's a mistake. That is an error. That is Satan's work. Because Satan does not want you to trust in Jesus Christ, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, and he is the only hope we have. And through Christ alone, we can receive forgiveness of our sin. And through Christ alone, we can have access to the Father. Muhammad does not want you to believe in that. Just do some good work. What does the scripture teach about good work? What does the scripture teach about forgiveness of sin? Listen to the scripture. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Without shed of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness. The only way we can receive forgiveness for our sin is through the blood. So amazingly, as you read the Quran, you never see anything about the blood. And we have a cartoon in the end of our seminar. We're going to tell you about the killing of the cow according to the Quran. But blood and Muhammad don't mix together. The one thing he took out of the story of Moses when he was in Egypt at the crossing of the Red Sea. Remember, Muhammad repeated the story of Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea and all the uh, Hebrew story we read in Exodus. It has been repeated in the Quran 27 times. And every time he made sure you don't talk about the blood of the lamb, the punishment number 10 on the Egyptian. Why? Because he does not want, want to talk about blood. And the scripture is very clear. Without shed of blood, no forgiveness of sin. Brothers and sisters, if you continue to live all your life doing good work, going to church and do all this wonderful thing, not believing in Jesus Christ, you spend eternity in hell. The only way you can be forgiven for your sin is believing in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And by his blood alone, we can receive forgiveness of our sin. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. When you study the Quran, literally from verse 1, chapter 1, to the last verse, talking about God, the God of Islam have nothing to do with the God of the Christian faith or the Jewish faith. I totally believe, beginning from verse 1 in, in the Quran, when Muslims pray, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to God, the Lord of the world, they are worshipping Satan. Because Satan and the Bible were very well known by being the Lord of this world, the God of this world. And that's the God Muslim people worship. Even the description of his names in the Quran tell us the same thing. Listen to this verse. So Allah leads astray whom he wills, and guides whom he wills, and he is the dear, the wise. In Surah 14, verse 4, God lead people astray. If Satan lead people astray from God's way, and God lead people astray from his own way, what was the difference between Satan and God? They're the same? Satan lead people astray. God do not lead people astray. Is the Quran in fable? The Quran tells me that God lead people astray? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
God desire in the scripture, we see it in 2 Peter 3, 9. He have one desire, one mind, one thought, one heart, every person to be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come last week. He did not come until today. He maybe wait until another week, another month, because he won't give you another chance to repent. He wants you to come back to him. His desire is not even one person to spend eternity in hell. But the Allah of Muhammad, the God of the Quran, very clearly, from the beginning of the creation, when he created Adam and Eve, he said the statement which is repeated over and over and over in the Quran. He will surely fill hell with human and demons. The desire of the God of Muhammad is to fill hell with human and demons. Now we change a little bit to some of the legal mistakes in the Quran. And believe me, I'm not sharing with you every mistake in the Quran. I'm just going, I'm picking up some of the mistakes. There are so many more for to you to find for yourself. Please read the Quran. Divorce. Divorce in Islam. I have studied this uh, two years in college in Alexandria, Egypt, and I was shocked. Literally, I was shocked. The more my professor, Dr. Muhammad, uh, speak and teach us about divorce in Islam and marriage in Islam, as we're going to see so many other things here, it is just Satan work. Can the Quran be the word of God? According to what we're going to be teaching here in this next few verses, listen carefully to chapter 2, verse 230. So if he divorces her a third time, so it is not lawful for him to take her again until she has sex with another husband. So if he divorces her, then there will be no sin on them if they return to each other, if they think that they can keep the limits of Allah. And these are the limits of Allah. He shows them to people who know. In Islam, a man can divorce his wife by simply saying the statement, you're divorced. She leaves the house. Within three months, he can change his mind and bring her back and say, you're divorced. For some reason, he, he gets mad at her and she divorces a second time. Now, after the second time, if he brought her back and he divorced her the third time, then it is not lawful for him to have her back. So we need to seek for what we call in Arabic al-muhallil, the person which will make his wife lawful back to him. So if she married another man, and if the new man divorced her, I'm not talking about marriage on paper, sign a piece of paper. I'm talking about true marriage, true intimate relationship between her and this new husband. If he, the new husband, divorced her, then it is lawful for her to go back to her first husband. This is what the book of Deuteronomy 24 calls the abomination. Very clearly, Old Testament, the books of Moses, which Muslim people say in America, they believe in it. It says, if a man divorced his wife and she left him, she married another man. If the new man die or if the new man, the new husband divorced her, she cannot go back to her first husband. Also in the Bible, they say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Jeremiah 1, uh, 3, 1 and Matthew 5, 31, 32 very clearly teaches God did not desire divorce for men. And if you read Matthew, Jesus' word, Muslim people say in America, we believe in Jesus. We believe in the gospel. Which gospel? I don't know. And which Jesus? I have no clue. Jesus says in Matthew, a man marry a divorced woman commit adultery with her. In Islam, a woman must marry again, divorce from her new husband, go back to her early husband, and they are lawful to each other. I'm sorry. Jesus cannot be a good prophet and a big liar. Jesus and Muhammad both cannot be right. To live in our society, and there's people around us who live in sin, and there must be a punishment for those who commit sin. And thank God for America and the freedom we have in this country that uh, people can have rights. 
People in America have more rights. As a matter of fact, animals in America have more rights than people in the Middle East. So if a person commits a, a crime, he will be punished, a, a, a good punishment equal to his crime. Let's see, what does the Quran teach about the punishment of crime? For example, in the chapter 5, verse 38, the Quran says, And the male thief and the female thief, so cut off their hands as reward of what they earned, as a punishment from Allah. And Allah is dear, wise. God is a dear, wise, that the punishment of somebody who steal is to cut his hand. How do we fix the community? How, we can, how can we live in this world by every person who commit a theft, he will be cut his hand. Now we're going to have more people in a welfare system. Now what about fixing the problem in a proper way? Find him a job. Maybe imprison him for six months or a year. Depend I mean, can you imagine if somebody steals something worth a hundred dollars, you cut his hand? And somebody steals something worth a million dollars, you cut his hand. Wow. Is this a just punishment? That's not what the Bible teaches to punish sin. Listen to what Jesus said. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He is a woman has been caught in adultery. She has been brought to Jesus by the Pharisees, the smart Jewish people who have in charge of everything. They brought Jesus and threw it under Jesus' feet and said, This woman has committed adultery. Moses says, We stone her. What do you say? Muslim people tell today, stone the woman who committed adultery. Where is the man who committed adultery? I have no idea. But women committed adultery, even up to last week, some women have been stoned to death because they committed adultery. What did Jesus do? He says the famous statement, Who is among you without sin? Let him stone her. Scriptures very clearly, they all left, beginning from the old to the young. Because for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not righteous, not even one. Not any Christian, not any Jew, not any Muslim, not any... All have sinned. When you, Muslim, become perfect in your life without sin, then you have the right to stone women who commit adultery. It is not justice. The punishment for sin in the Quran is not justice. Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran truly the word of God? Spreading Islam. So amazingly that Islam has spread all over the world in few years. And when you study and you search and read the history, how Islam is spread from one country to another country without even the words of the Quran to be translated to these new countries, even up to today. It's been 1,400 years and the Quran has never been translated to many of the million of billion, actually billion, 200 million plus of Muslims in the world today have never read the Quran in their language even to today. But Islam spread. How did Islam spread? Oh, Muslim people in America say, in peace and love. There was never any warfare. There were never any killing. Is that what we read in the Quran? On reading the Quran, one come to conclusion, Islam spread in peace and love? How about listen to this verse? In chapter 48, verses 16 and 17. Listen to how Islam spread all over the world. According to the Quran, Say to those Bedouins who lagged behind in battle, You will be called to face a people who have substantial mighty valor. You will wage war against them, or they will become Muslims. So if you obey, Allah will give you a good wage. And if you turn away, as you turned away before, He will torment you with a painful torment. There is no blame on the blind, nor blame on the lame, nor blame on the sick. And whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, he will admit him into gardens. Below them the rivers flow, and whoever turns away, he will torment him with a painful torment. There was only two options for the Muslim followers of Muhammad. Go around, meet people, fight them, or they become Muslim. Islam spread by the sword, and there are so many verses, and we covered this in our first presentation, uh, revealing the truth about Islam. Very clearly, Islam spread by the sword, killing people or people becoming Muslim. 
But if they repent and establish worship, means converted to Islam, then let them go free. That's what the Quran teaches. Islam spread by the sword. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but you can get our first presentation revealing the truth about Islam very clearly. So many verses all over the Quran teach one message, spread, spreading of Islam by the sword. What about the Bible? How did Christianity spread around the world? Did Jesus give his disciples each one a sword or two and said, go out and meet the people and chop off their head if they do not accept the true face of Christianity? How did Jesus commanded his disciples. What, what, what should you do? Since Jesus' days until today, we still do the same. Listen to Jesus' words. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, neither hear your words. When you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Shake the dust off your feet. That's the only thing we can do when people reject our faith. We knock at people's door. We go to people's cities and countries and tell them Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sin. If you believe in Jesus, you'll be forgiven. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And people say, uh-uh, we don't want to hear this. We don't believe in that. What do we do? Shake up the dust of our feet. That's all what we can do. And that's how Christianity spread all over the world. Not by the sword as Muhammad taught in the Quran. Let's move to a little bit a different topic here. Social mistakes in the Quran. We live in a society. Humans live together. There must be some rules and regulations in the Quran. How should we live in community? The Quran is very clearly, let's read few of the verses which really terrible social error or mistakes in the Quran. For example, is man and woman are equal? As we cover this in our seminar, Women in Islam, it's very clearly Islam is spreading in the Western society like the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe, by lying as a female and telling them that in Islam, women and, and men are equal. Literally, they're teaching them the opposite of what the Quran teaches. Does really the Quran teach men and women are equal? Listen to this verse, 2, 282. Chapter 2, verse 282, and chapter 411, and so many others. Please get a copy of our presentation, Women in Islam, and you will find the truth for yourself. Listen to the Quran. So if the debtor was mentally deficient or weak or cannot dictate, so let his friend dictate with fairness and call two witnesses from your men. So if there were not two men, so one man and two women of those among you, whom you are pleased for witnesses, so that if one of the women should make an error, the other may cause her to remember. Very clearly. We have a case now of somebody who cannot dictate for himself about inheriting, so you get two men to sign the paper, grandpa or father when he dies is going to leave this number of dollars this, to his son. His son is mentally deficient. Now, if you don't find two men, you get what? One man and two women. Why? Because women are stupid. They don't remember good. The opposite of reality. Because we know that women use the right plane, uh, right side of their brain and left side of their brain in the same time. They will remember much better than men. But in the Quran, one man equal to two women in the case of witness. How about in chapter 4, verse 11? Allah commands you concerning your children to the male, the like portion of two females. So when Baba die and there is inheritance, and now the son will get twice as the daughter in a in society where women cannot work. If it's my opinion, women, children, female, get everything. Sons can go out and work. And some Muslims will tell you, well, she lived with her husband. Her husband take care of all her needs. Half is plenty. Since the man is responsible to feed the family, aren't you assuming every woman in Islam is a happy married woman? How about the widow one? How about the one who never been married? How about the divorced one? Is half is enough? Chapter 4, verse 34, the Quran talks about another issue here of treatment of women. Listen to what the Quran teaches. Men are in charge of women because Allah preferred some of them above the others, 
and because of what they spend out of their money. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded, and of whom you fear rebellion. So preach to them and separate from them in beds and scourge them. So if they obey you, so do not seek a way against them. Surely Allah was higher, big. Was it written in the Quran, men are equal to women? No, men are in charge of women. And then men can scourge their wives. Some scholars say, beat them lightly, as long as you don't break bones. Men are not equal to men in the Quran. The Bible obviously teaches a different complete story. In uh, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. One in Christ Jesus. Male and female are equal in the Christian faith. One in Christ Jesus. No different. Black, white, slave, free, Jew, Greek, all one in Christ Jesus. How about the polygamy marriage in Islam? We, can we live in a society right according to the teaching of the Quran about marriage? Listen to what the Quran teaches. And if you fear that you cannot deal fairly among the orphans, so marry what appeals to you from the women, two and three and four. So if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one wife, or have sex with what your right hand possesses. This is near that you may not have hardship. So in Islam, according to the Quran, a man, if he treat his wife equally, he can have up to four free Muslim women. That's the one kind of marriage. The second marriage in the same verse is what your right hand possesses. That's concubine slaves. Any number, unlimited number of wives. That's besides the marriage for fun and a marriage for uh, travelers and so many different kind of marriage in Islam. But a man marry four women and all what his right hand possessed is this a, a, the right way to we, uh, as a human, live in a social, modern days? What does the Bible teach about marriage? Can bring what the Quran teaches about marriage. See, if you compare the Bible to the Quran, you come to the conclusion that there is a book is called the Word of God, and there is other book which is not the Word of God. Is the Quran infallible? According to this one verse here we're talking about, the teaching of a multiplying number of wives, in Matthew 19, 4 and 6, the Bible says, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. A man leave his father and his mother, unite with his wife, and they are one flesh. You tell me in Islam, a man leave his father and mother, unite with numbers of wives, and they become number of flesh? That's a great difference. Let's uh, go to some scientific mistakes or errors in the Quran. And uh, there are so many of them, I just picked up few. And uh, let's just look at what does the Quran teach about scientific issues. For example, uh, the human reproduction. God made Adam and Eve. Uh, by the way, Eve never exists in the Quran. Her name was never mentioned. But uh, God made human and how God even continue today to make more babies. Listen to what the Quran says about this very important issue. So let the human look to what he was created from. He was created from gushing water. It comes out from backbones and breasts. Man was made out of gushing water. This word in Arabic and in so many other parts of the Quran is called natfa. And Muhammad followed some of the Greek philosophers or the Greek thoughts which was given a good five, six hundred years before him, which clearly they said in their belief that a baby is made inside the womb a result of two fluids. The white fluid comes from the men, which we know by sperm, and the yellow fluid, which comes from the women. The white sperm comes from the men, from the backbones, and the woman, uh, yellow fluid, comes from the breasts. 
And if the baby, as the mom and dad uh, make love, if the uh, sperm comes first, the baby will look like his daddy and will be a boy. And if the yellow fluid comes first from the woman's body before the man's sperm, then the baby will look like his mama girl. That's why there are millions of women in Islam has been divorced because they believe that it was her fault that the baby is always a girl, not a boy. And you know that Arab Muslim like men's than girls. We just found discovery later, just a few years ago, that man sperm is the one who control what kind of baby is going to be a boy or a girl. And all these millions and millions of Muslim women who has been divorced, they were divorced unjustly. But what do we learn from this verse? That the sperm come from the backbones and the yellow fluid came from the breast of the woman. Does this fit scientifically? Is the Quran infallible? A little bit more about human reproduction, we'll share with you uh, another verse, chapter 23 and verse 14. What does the Quran teach? It? Then we created the nutfa into a clot, so we created the clot into a piece of flesh, so we created the piece of flesh into bones, so we clothed the bones with flesh, then we made it another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best of the creators. This is how baby is made. There's, uh, there's this, uh, four different stages where since the beginning of uh, uh, fertilization until the baby come out, Muhammad put him in the Quran. Do you know that there are Muslims in America today using this false scientific uh, statement to prove that Muhammad is a prophet? How in the world did Muhammad know human reproduction 1400 years ago unless he's a true prophet? As if this statement is true. Listen to the response the scientific response to such a verse in the Quran. There are four orders of error in this small passage. However, it is no fault of Muhammad. He did not have the technology available to discover the truth about embryology through observation. First error, we created nutfa into a clot. Sperm does not mutate into blood cells. The cells which form blood, much less blood clotting agents, do not begin function until the fourth week of pregnancy. During this first month, many other cell types have to form prior to blood and clotting. Second error. We created the clot into a piece of flesh. This is mentioned as an additional error since the Quran presents the idea that human life is grown from a clot to a later collection of other cells or lump. As mentioned above, that is not the case. Third error. So we created the piece of flesh into bones. The order presented in the Quran is fertilization, blood or cell formations, bones, then flesh. This is absolutely false. Cells for organs and flesh actually begin formation before bone tissue. Later as the child grows, bone structures begin to develop along with organs and flesh. Fourth error. So we clothe the bones with flesh. As mentioned above, cellular division, which forms bone tissue, takes place after flesh and organs begin developing. The picture painted in the Quran is very different. Every modern observation of fetal formation demonstrates conclusively that the Quran's order of events are in extreme error. Can the Quran be God's word with such an error in it? Is the Quran infallible? For more information, you can go to www.aboutisa.com. It's a very wonderful website. can teach you more about such uh, issues like that. Fables. Not only the Quran contain uh, 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 is, uh, the verses or the stories of the Bible, he also, Muhammad, include in his Quran so many fables. Just last night, I spent some time with a Muslim friend from India, and as me and him talked and we went through some of these fables, he was shaking his head. This can't be in the Quran. This can't be true. And it is. And sadly, over one billion Muslims in the world never read such a thing. And it is in the Quran. But unless a Muslim people read the Quran, understand the Quran, then they will continue being Islam. When a Muslim reads the Quran, understand the Quran, literally, he will think twice about such religion. That's why I encourage people to read the Quran. That's why we work hard to translate the Quran to a true English translation for the last two and a half years. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims and what do they believe? 
Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace and that Jews, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors, immoral teachings, and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoated, they watered it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran. We must separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verses of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy-to-follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament, and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. It is very important for us Christians to know what the Quran teaches. It's very important for us to share what the Quran teaches with the Muslim. We're assuming that all Muslims in the world read the Quran and understood the Hadith. No, they have not. Listen to some of the fables in the Quran. For example, ants. You know, the Bible talks about the wisdom of Solomon. He was a very wise man. I mean, he reads the book of Proverbs, wonderful 31 chapter full of wisdom. Also, the Quran talks about Solomon and how wise he was. He was able to talk to the ants. He was able to talk to the birds. And the fables go on and on and on in the Quran. Listen to the ants. How wise this ants is. And how powerful this ant is. The story comes, chapter 27, verse 16 to 18, and going on. And Solomon inherited David, and he said, O oh, you people, we have been taught the speech of the birds, and we have been given from everything. Surely this is the manifest bounty. And to Solomon, his troops of the jinn and the humans and the birds were gathered, so they were spread, until they reached the valley of ants. And ant said, O oh, you ants, enter into your dwellings, lest Solomon and his troops crush you, and they do not feel. Solomon have an army, and the army contain of demons and birds and, uh, and human and everything. And Solomon was a fighter. He is an invader like Muhammad. I, I, I can imagine Muhammad think of Solomon to be like him. If Muhammad have read the Bible, they will, he will come to the conclusion, oh, what he wrote about Solomon was wrong. 
Because the scripture is very clearly, the only reason God refused David to build the temple because he had a bloody hand. He is the one who is involved in so many wars. And God said, not you, but your son Solomon. He is the one who will build the temple. And the scripture is very clearly, during the 40 years of ruling of King Solomon, the earth rested. There were peace all over the world. There were never any fight. There was never any wars. But here, the story is a little bit different. Solomon had demons in his army. Some of them were divers. He will go under the water and do some special work for Muhammad, for, for, uh, for Solomon. But the amazing thing here, as Solomon and his army marching, one of the ants, small, tiny, tiny, little bit, bit, little bit, bit, tiny, small ants down here. You can't see it, but it's here. And the ants said to the other ants around her, Careful, Solomon is going to crush you and his army. Let's go back to our homes, hide from Solomon that he may crush us. Well, Solomon was a prophet, Solomon was a wise man, and he knows the language of the bird, and he knows the language of the ants. But how in the world these tiny small ants know that these people are coming are Solomon and his troops? Was also the ants very wise one too? Strange. Amazing. By the way, I did a study on ants. You can go online for yourself and do study for ants. And I found that ants do not talk. Ants do not have voice box. Ants do not have lungs. Ants breathe through hundreds of holes all over their body. Ants communicate with each other with a smell. No ants talk. All kind of ants do not talk. How did the ants talk to Solomon? I have no idea. It's just another fable. Listen to Solomon respond when he heard the ants and what she said. Then he smiled, laughing at her sayings, and he said, My Lord, inspire me to thank your grace, which you graced on me and on my parents, and that I do a good deed that will be pleasing to you, and admit me by your mercy among your good servants. So Solomon heard her, even though Solomon and his army were marching. I think if you have a soldier, a good 50 soldier or 100 soldier marching, there is no way you can hear an ant, even if they can talk. But Solomon heard her, and Solomon laughed, and a wonderful fable in the Quran. The story of the ants. Let's move to the bird. Solomon and the bird. And he inspected the bird, so he said, Why is it that I do not see the hoopoe? Or was he of the absent? Surely I will torment him with a severe torment or I will surely slaughter him, or he brings to me a manifest authority. So he did not tarry long, so he said, I have gained the knowledge that you do not know, and I came to you from Sheba with sure news. You know, I know some birds can talk, and I know my neighbor in Northport, where I used to live, uh, he used to have a bird, and I go by his house in Christmas time, or in Easter time, summer or winter, his bird always say, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. That's all what the bird knows how to say. There may be some smarter bird who can say uh, an, another 10 word or 20 word. But listen to all the words come out of this bird's mouth. I mean, the Quran says, human and jinn, if they gather together, they could not write anything like what is in the Quran. And when I read the Quran, I found that bird writes beautiful sentence in the Quran. Listen to the rest of the bird's words. Surely I have found a woman reigning over them, gifted with everything, and she has a great throne. And I found her and her people worshipping to the sun without Allah, and Satan adorns their works so that he prevented them from the way, so they are not guided. Will they not worship to Allah who brings the secret things of the heavens and the earth and knows what you hide and what you reveal? See, I don't believe a bird can talk and say all that. There's no way a bird can do that. Continue. Allah, there is no God but Him, the Lord of the great throne. He said, We will see if you are truthful, or you are among the liars. Go with this, my book, so throw it down to them. Then turn away from them, so see what is their return. Not only the bird can talk, he can go back to Sheba and he carries the message of Solomon and he went back to Sheba and the story goes on and on. What amazing bird. 
I love cartoon. I mean, I watch cartoons since my son was born. And I love to watch uh, Sesame Bird, the, the Sesame Street, and the big bird talking. But I never saw that when you read the Quran, you find birds talk like that. Cartoon, yeah, makes sense. Real life, I don't think so. It's just a fable. It's just another fable Muhammad put in the Quran. Can the Quran be with the Word of God? Is the Quran infallible? So when we decreed the death on him, nothing showed them that he was dead, but a small worm of the earth that ate away his staff, which supported his corpse. So, when he fell, the jinn perceived that, if they had known the unseen, they had not continued in this shameful torment. Here is Solomon's death. The king Solomon, the wise man, even in his death was wise, that he was dead while he is sticking like this on a piece of wood, staff. And he was dead, according to the Muslim scholar, for a whole entire year. And nobody figured out that he was dead. He was so wise, even while he's dead, he was wise until some worm, some bugs, ate the staff, the, the piece of wood we stick in it, and then he fall off, and then they found out that King Solomon has been dead for an entire, after a whole entire year. And demons were upset. Oh, if we knew that he was dead, we did not work hard all last year. <laughs> did Solomon have any children? Did Solomon have any grandchildren? Some of the kids go talk to grandpa. This, I mean, what kind of king, what kind of kingdom a man is dead for a whole year and nobody found out? Just another made up story by Muhammad about Solomon. Yes, Solomon was a wise man. Read the scripture, read the book of Proverbs, and read about Solomon in his judging and how the world was living in peace in his 40 years of ruling because he was a wise man. And the story is in the Bible, not in the Quran. What do we have in the Quran? It's just a fable, made up story by Muhammad. Now, in the Bible, you read different story written in different places with different order, with different timing, and everything in the Bible is in order. So we know that Adam and Eve came first, and we go to Noah, and we go to his uh, uh, children, he get to Abraham, and he get, you know, there is order. Now, in the Quran, as normally what Muhammad does, is he does not know who came first and who came second. Where do you talk about that? And here, in one story in the Quran, he makes in three stories together. Listen to the story of the Quran in chapter 2, verse 246. Have you not seen the gathering of the children of Israel after Moses? When they said to a prophet for them, Set up for us a king. We will engage in war for the sake of Allah. He said, Will it be that you would not go to war if waging war is decreed for you? They said, And why should we not go to war for the sake of Allah? And indeed, we and our children are driven forth from our dwellings. But when war was decreed to them, they turned back, except for a few of them. And Allah knows the unjust. After Moses, we go from Moses to king. Is this how the Bible tells us the story, the history of the Jewish nation? Was it Moses and king or Moses and judges and many prophets? And then the Jewish people ask the prophet Samuel, we want a king. We're talking about hundreds of years. But the Quran, just forget about it. Why waste time? Get to the king. And then the prophet told them, well, I'm afraid to give you a king. And then the kings will ask you to fight. And then you will not fight and we have a problem. Oh, no, 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 prophet, don't worry. We're going to fight. How, we, how, how can we do not fight and we have been kicked out of our homes? Really? Did the Jewish people were kicked out of Egypt or they left by their own choice, by their own will? As a matter of fact, my Pharaoh, my king Pharaoh, refused hard to let them go. He does not want to lose them. But the Quran tells the story a little bit different. Okay, let's go continue with the story and see what else happened. And their prophet said to them, Surely Allah has sent Saul as a king to you. They said, How can the kingdom be to him over us when we are more worthy of the kingdom than him, and he has no abundance of money? He said, Surely Allah has chosen him to be over you and has given him increase in knowledge and stature. And Allah gives his kingdom to whom he wills, and Allah is large, knowing. By the way, we do not know who is this prophet. As normally Muhammad talk about some prophets, one of them tells the other, okay? So the prophet told them, God, choose Saul to be your king. And they shout, hooray, hooray, we got our king, as the Bible said. No, 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 two completely different stories. 
They said, how can he rule over us and we are worthy of the kingdom more than him? He is even a poor. Was really Saul in the Bible a poor? Did he come from a poor home or a rich home? Did the Jewish really, as you read the true story in the Bible, rejected Saul? Or did they shout hooray and they were happy with their king? Complete different story. Of course, Muslim will tell you, uh, that proves that the Bible is wrong. But wait with me. Let's keep going a little bit with the story. And their prophet said to them, Surely the sign of his kingdom will be that the ark will come to you. In it is tranquility from your Lord, and the relics left by the family of Moses and the family of Aaron. The angels will carry it. Surely in this is a sign to you if you were believers. Angels carrying the ark? This is the mark God put for the Jewish people to know that Saul is the one who he, he chose to be a king over them? I could not find one Muslim scholar can explain to me such a verse. It's just blah, 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 blah. Poetry. No true, no history. Let's keep going with the story. So when Saul marched forth with the troops, he said, Surely Allah will test you by a river. So whoever drinks of it is not of me. But he who does not taste it, he is surely of me, except those who scoop by their hand and drink, only a few of them. And when they had passed it, he and those who believed with him, they said, We have no strength this day against Goliath and his troops. Those among them who thought that they would meet Allah said, How may a small group have victory over a large group by Allah's permission? And Allah is with the patient. So God tested, tempted the Jewish people by the river. And he said to them, whoever drink from it is not from me, and who does not drink it is from me. What we're talking about here? Gideon's story. You need to go back to the Bible, the book of Judges, and read the true story. And by the way, the difference between Gideon and between Saul and David and Goliath is a good uh, five, six hundred years. But Muhammad mixed them all together. A nice dish of salad. You need to read the true story in the book of Judges. And he found that Gideon, who was called by God, a mighty man, even though he's afraid, and he's uh, 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 careful to even go outside and harvest his uh, wheat like normal people do in the air. But God told him, you're a mighty man. And, and there's a long story you read in the Bible, in the book of uh, uh, Judges. And then Gideon was chosen by God to uh, give delivery for the Jewish people. And then God said, okay, Gideon, you need to go to fight. So Gideon got a thousand people with him. God said, uh-uh. That's too much. He said first, there was a larger number, and then he said, announced to everybody, who is afraid, go home. And he announced, and the leftover was a thousand people. And God said, that's too much. See, if I deliver you with a thousand men, then the, you may think that you are, by your own might, by your own strength, you are able to deliver yourself. I, I, I want you to take them by the river and let them drink. And I'm going to tell you whom you keep and whom you put, send back home. And literally, those who bend down and put water in their hand and they drink, those, uh, 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 Gideon put them aside, and those who drink like a dog licking by their tongue, he put them aside, and 700 went home. 300 men, and God delivered the Jewish people and gives them power over the Midianites by 300 men without any fight. Just uh, uh, read the story in the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. But Muhammad mixed Gideon with the Saul, with David, with the, with the Goliath, as we have heard. And then David kills the Goliath. And it is uh, just another error all over the Quran. Is the Quran in Babel? Is the Quran is the word of God? Can be this a book to be uh, 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 read by assurance it is the word of God? Of course not. And when they went forth against Goliath and his troops, they said, Our Lord, pour out patience on us and set our feet firm and give us victory against the infidel people. They advance against Goliath? Well, let's read the story in the Bible. It was David, David alone, five rocks. He swung and let it go and hit him in his head and Goliath fall down. David didn't even have a sword. He takes the sword of Goliath and he cut his head with it. But here, Muhammad's gone. All of them went and fight the Goliaths. It's like Goliath is an army. Here's the Quran in Fable. The question can be answered simply by reading the Quran. So they defeated them by the permission of Allah. And David killed Goliath. And Allah gave him the kingdom and the wisdom. And he taught him from whatever he willed. 
And were it not that Allah gives conquest to some people over others, then the earth would have been vandalized. But Allah is bountiful to the worlds. These are the verses of Allah. We recite them to you with the truth, and surely you are of the messengers. Truth? What is truth? These are the verses of God. We recited to you. God is speaking to Muhammad with the truth. These are lies, not anything even to be close to the truth. The ants and the bird and Solomon's death and Saul and David and Gideon. And as you keep going, reading on and on in the Quran, the whole Quran is like that. It just made up stories, mixed up stuff together, and life goes on. The cavemen. If you go to the Quran, chapter 18, you hear or you study, you read, read the story of this cavemen. It's not even a true story. It never happened. But Muhammad put it in the Quran thinking it's another true story. Listen to the story of the cavemen. It's another fable in the Quran. Or did you think that the companions of the cave and Al-Rakim were of the wonders of our signs? When the young men took refuge in the cave, so they said, Our Lord, grant us mercy from you and prepare a right course for us in our affair. So we struck on their ears in the cave many years. Then we raised them up so that we might know which of the two parties could best discern the time they stayed. We will relate to you their news with the truth. Surely they were young men who believed in their Lord, and we increased them guidance. Some young men believe in God, run to the cave as a place of refuge because there was persecution. And, uh, and, and, and Muhammad, they uh, take up this story, which obviously uh, made up by men, and he put in the Quran to be a true story, and we, we could not find in the world, where is this place, where is this story take place, like most story made up by Muhammad. When it take place, we don't know. Who are these young men, we don't know. How many are they, we don't know. It's just another story in the Quran. Listen to the rest of the story. And we tied on their hearts when they stood up. So they said, Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We will not call any God other than Him. Indeed, if we did, then we set a transgression. Those our people have taken other gods than Him. Were it that they had brought to them a clear authority. So who is more unjust than one who forged a lie against Allah? And if you separate from them and what they serve except Allah, so take refuge in the cave. Your Lord will unfold his mercy to you and will prepare a way for your affairs. And you see the sun when it rose bending to the right of their cave, and when it set going from them on the left side, and they are in a wide space in it. This is from the signs of Allah. Whomever Allah guided, so he is the guided. And whomever he leads astray, so you will not find for him a guided friend. Here they are, this young man inside the cave are sleeping. The sun come up one side and go down another side. Sun come up every day, up and down, up and down, for a long, long time. Continue with the story. And you thought that they were awake, but they were sleeping. And we turned them to the right and to the left. And in the entry lay their dog with paws outstretched. Had you looked at them, you would surely have turned away from them in flight, and you would have been filled with fear of them. As I just said, they were sleeping, and they, were, uh, they looked a little bit scary, and God, with his angels, you know, turned them around a little bit to the left, turned them around a little bit to the right. You know, I've been in a nursing home before, and some of the old uh, patients in nursing home, they could not move themselves, and the nurse had to move them right and left, so they will not hurt their back, and move them a little bit, and, and this is what's happening every day, every day, well, sometimes moves them to the right, sometimes moves them to the left, and here is the dog, sleep, stretch up his arm and his legs. Okay, keep going with the story. And likewise, we raised them up, that they might question one another. One of them said, How long have you stayed here? They said, We have stayed a day or part of a day. They said, Your Lord knows best how long you have stayed. So send now one of you with this, your paper, into the city. So let him see who in it has the purest food, so he will bring to you a provision from it. And let him be courteous, and let not anyone feel you. A little bit later, God raised him up from the sleep. And then God questions him. Uh, how long did you guys been here? Or they asking one another, how long have we been sleeping here? Some said, we've been asleep for uh, a few hours, half a day, a day. We don't know really. Yet. Okay, so take this money and go buy food. 
And God is going with the story with Muhammad in the Quran about the cave men. Surely if they prevail against you, they will stone you or turn you back into their religion, and then you will never prosper. And likewise, we made their adventure known so that they might know that the promise of Allah is true and the hour, there is no doubt in it. When they disputed among themselves concerning their affairs, so they said, Build a building over them, their Lord knows best about them. Those who prevailed in the affair said, We will surely raise over them a place of worship. Just make sure when you go to buy the food from the town, you don't tell anybody about who you are. Keep yourself in secret. Don't show yourself. Don't show your identity. Because if they find out who you are and you are the true power of God, you are the true worshiper of God, that means they're going to kill you. And God keep going with the story. And the Quran says, They will say, Three, their fourth is their dog. And they say, Five, their sixth is their dog, guessing of the unseen. And they say, Seven, and their eighth is their dog. Say, My Lord knows best their number. No one knows them except a few. So do not dispute in them except with reference to that which appeared. And do not ask anyone about them. And do not say about anything, I will surely do it tomorrow. How many is it worth? I mean, if God knows, why not God, the one who's telling the truth about the story, tell us in the Quran there were eight, there were ten, there were twenty. There may be two guys. No one knows, even God does not know, even the Quran said God knows. Why not God tell us how many there were? We know there's one dog, but we don't know how many were with the dog. And then this verse obviously comes from the book of James. The last verse, do not say that I'm going to do this tomorrow or surely I'm going to do this tomorrow unless you say by God's will. James said that. Only if Allah wills and remember your Lord when you forget and say, perhaps my Lord will guide me so that I may come near the right answer of this. And they abided in their cave 300 years and add nine. Say, Allah knows how long they abided. To him are the unseen things of the heavens and the earth. See by him and hear. They do not have any friend other than him, and no one partners in his judgment. 309 years. What a fable. This guy was sleeping in the cave for 309 years. Is the Quran infallible? The killing of the cow. You know, as I told you early, that Muhammad does not like to talk about blood. Muhammad does not talk uh, about uh, sacrifice or, 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 or anything to, to which really is the truth about bringing salvation to man. In the Old Testament was sacrifice, in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. And Muhammad denied both, right and left. But in Muhammad, in the Quran, in chapter 2, verse 67 to, to verse 73, he tells us about the story of the killing of the cow. And when you ask yourself, why in the world Muhammad puts this story in the Quran, I have no answer. I mean, th there is no point for him to talk about the kingdom of the cow because he does not believe in anything about shedding blood. And as you read the story, it doesn't really make too much sense. You have to read the Bible. You have to go back to the Bible and read the true story of the killing of the cow and why the Jewish people were killing cows and sheep and different pure animals for sacrifice, for forgiveness of sin. And the story goes like that. Moses went up to the mountain. Literally, he went to talk with God. And God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, hear what I want you to do. Blah, 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 blah. And Moses left the mountain and came down to earth. And when Moses said to his people, Surely Allah commands you to sacrifice a cow, they said, Do you scoff at us? He said, I seek refuge from Allah, that I be of the foolish ones. They said, Call on your Lord for us, that he would inform us what it is. Are you joking with us, Moses? Do you really, really want us to kill a cow? Was this strange thing to the Hebrews? I mean, what happened just before they left Egypt, before they get to the promised land? They kill a sheep. Every household kill a sheep. And they put the blood on the two sides of the door and the top part of the door. Because when the angels of the Lord went by, he killed every firstborn of the Egyptian, but the Hebrew not because of the blood. They know about the killing of cows and killing of blood. Shedding of blood. So if it's a sheep or a cow or whatever size of animals, it depends on the size of the family. The Jewish people know about the blood, even all the way from Adam and Eve to Noah to their days. 
Are you joking with us, Moses? You want us to kill a cow? Okay, okay, we'll kill a cow, but uh, ask God, what kind of cow should we kill? Okay, then Moses obviously went back to the top of the mountain. Talk to God. God, my people are willing to kill a cow. Just tell us, what kind of cow should we kill? And God says, He said, surely he said, it is a cow, neither old nor young, between the two. So do what you are commanded. What a great answer from God. Uh, not old, not young, somewhere in the middle. How old? I mean, when you read the scripture, it's very clear. It says a sheep, a year old, a cow, three years old, and so on. You keep going from one story to another story. In the Bible. It's exactly, even when Moses went up back all the way to the top of the mountain, talked to God about how old this cow is, God did not really give him an answer. Uh, not old, not young, somewhere in the middle. What is in the middle? But They said, Call on your Lord for us, that he would inform us what is its color. Well, Moses, we're willing to kill a cow, but, I mean, for heaven's sake, help us out here. It's a, is, is it a white cow? Is this an orange cow? Is it a, a gray cow? Or is it a yellow cow? Or a red cow? I mean, there's lots of cows here. We have to pick up the right color now. We don't want to make a mistake here and, and kill the wrong cow. Which color do you want? So Moses went back to the top of the mountain. God, we need help. My people are willing to kill the cow, but we need to know what color it is. And God told Moses, He said, Surely he said, She is a yellow cow. Her color is bright. She pleases the beholders. They said, Call on your Lord for us, that he would inform us what it is. Surely cows are alike to us, and surely, if Allah will, we will be guided. Amazing, even when Muhammad pick up a color, he pick up the wrong color. The Bible clearly says, a heifer, red cow, not yellow cow. So in the Quran, he gave us the wrong color. Here we go. But then the, the, the Jewish people say, okay, okay, Moses, we, we're, we're, in, we're in agreement here. We're going to kill a cow, not old, not young. Uh, it is, uh, it is a, a yellow cow, and, 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 and uh, we, we need some more help. What kind of yellow cow exactly? Moses go up back to the mountain, talk to God one more time. Oh, God Almighty, one more help here. What kind of cow? They're willing to do it. Just tell me, what, what kind of cow? And God says, He said, Surely he said, Surely it is a cow, not worn by plowing the earth or watering the field, submissive, no blemish in her. They said, Now you come with the truth. So they slaughtered her. And they almost did not do it. Man or oh man, they almost did not do it. A cow never works in the farm. It's just a nice, smooth, peaceful cow, yellow one. Why? Why we have all the story? When you read the scriptures, the Bible is very clearly God told Moses one time in the top of the mountain. It was a 40 day trip, and God told him everything one time what kind of cow, what color it is, what do you do exactly, what do you do with ashes, who burn it, where you burn it, what do you do with. I mean, the Bible is very clear one trip. And here in the Quran, Moses going up to the mountain, ask God, come down to the mountain, talk to the people. One more question go back to God, down to earth, back to God, down to earth, so many times. I mean, it is a joke. Is the Quran infallible? And so far, we do not know why they killed the cow. What was the purpose? But here is the answer from the Quran. And when you kill a soul and disagree among yourselves about it, and Allah brings forth what you were hiding, so we said, strike him with part of it. Likewise, Allah gives life to the dead and shows you his signs. Perhaps you may understand. Do you really figure out why the Jewish people kill a cow? I don't. That's the end of the story. What about the Bible? What does the Bible teach about the true story about killing the cow? If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take an heifer 
which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for them that the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their sword shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O God, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood upon thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer, and lay them without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Purification for sin. Purification for sin. The reason of the story. By the way, when you read the story in the Bible, uh, in other locations, it tells us it's red hopper. But here, as you read the story, it is consistent. One time, God is telling Moses, Hear what you need to do. One, two, three, four, five. There's no going up down to the mountain, up down to the mountain, because they ask one more question, they ask more question. God knows the whole thing. He tells exactly to Moses who will kill the cow, who will gather the ashes. What is for is for purification. And the story clear in the Bible. Is the Quran infallible? Is the Quran is the true word of God? As you see in the scale. No, it is not. I wish I had more time to share more and more about the error and the mistakes all over the Quran. Read the Quran for yourself. My Muslim friends, the Quran is not the word of God. The Bible is the true word of God. As simple as just read both books. The truth has been given to you in the scripture. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the most important thing which Muhammad worked so hard all over the Quran to deny the deity of Christ, the work of, of Christ on the cross for your sin. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, if you do not have Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you must pay for your sin. To be pure of your sin, you must have blood. And the shed of blood of Jesus Christ on the cross is the only hope for you and I. Will you read the Quran one more time? Will you read the Bible side by side next to the Quran so you can find for yourself the truth? God love you. Jesus loves you. That's why Jesus came to this world, died on the cross, rose from the dead, that you may have life and have it abundantly. And that's what Muhammad is hiding from you in the Quran. Is the Quran the word of God? Is the Quran is the truth? I rest my case. It has once been said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Muslims contend that the Quran does not merely contain the word of God, but that it is the Word of God, perfect in every way. In this seminar, we have conclusively shown that the Quran contains many scientific, historical, geographical, botanical, legal, and theological errors that cannot be explained away. Surely these irreconcilable problems will demonstrate to all that the Quran cannot be the infallible Word of God. Here at the Straight Way of Grace Ministry, we travel the world preaching the simple message that Jesus is the light of the world, a light that will dispel the darkness of Islam. We share these truths with churches and other organizations through a series of seminars entitled Revealing the Truth About Islam. We cover a wide variety of topics such as Has the Bible been corrupted? What the Quran teaches about Jesus Christ? Muhammad or Christ? Who is greater? Women in Islam? What the Quran teaches about Joseph. What the Quran teaches about Jonah. What the Quran teaches about Moses. And many other topics. Our sincere desire is that you would come to know the love of God and to experience the forgiveness of sins that He provides through Jesus Christ. If you have not yet trusted in Christ, would you pray a prayer like this one? 
Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I confess all my sins to you and ask that you forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and I want to turn from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Now I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I confess you as the Lord and Savior of my life. I give you my life and I ask that you would give me your Holy Spirit to take control of my life from this point on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If your church or organization would like more information regarding the Straight Wave Grace Ministry, please visit us online at www.thestraightway.org or call us at 941